So a couple of questions that came in toward the end of last, last hour about water flow. I, to, 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 just to, to remind you where, where things stand, we're, we're in transition, I guess, between the, the, the story of water distribution and the story of garden watering. Where the story of water distribution I do first with the idea that let's look at how water moves around uh, or how water is, is, yeah, how water moves around gently um, and watch the energy move through it. But let's treat the water as a perfect system. And so there are issues, things like water uh, has no viscosity in the world of, in, in my world of water distribution, makes life simple. As we'll see, there's no turbulence in it, it also makes water simple. So basically, we're setting aside all the complexities uh, of real water moving around and looking at some of the simple behaviors it's got. And then with going into garden watering, my, 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 the idea in that is to start introducing some of the complexities of water. So let me briefly come back to water in, the, in its simplest uh, character, set aside the complexities and watch water move around. And some of the questions that came in, one of them is, is what if the straw is horizontal? And so what I think we're talking about here is, I, I, I told you, uh, um, uh, among other things, that when you draw water up a straw with your mouth, what you're doing is you're not attracting the water, you're allowing the atmospheric pressure down at the bottom of the, the open container that has the straw sitting in it, the open container of water, you're allowing atmospheric pressure there to push up on the, on the column of water relatively unopposed. And how you do that, you take a lot of the air molecules out of the top of the straw and now the pressure drops there for, for all the reasons that we've already dealt with. So you've got a low pressure on top of the column of water within the straw. You need the straw there because you have to protect that region of space from the surrounding air which would otherwise go, oh, low pressure, I'll fill that in. So you make low pressure in the middle, in the, in the straw above the column of water and now there's a pressure difference between higher pressure that being atmosphere at the bottom of the straw, and low pressure, that being what you've done with your mouth, above, uh, above the column in the, in the straw. And that can support a certain amount, a certain height of water. Uh, there's a limit to how high that column of water can be because atmospheric pressure is limited. So it, it turns out it can only be about 30 some feet, 33 feet or whatever, that column of water. You can't draw water higher than that in a straw. All right, but in that context then, the, the, uh, the column of water's weight is what's limiting all that. If you tip the straw sideways, now gravity is kind of out of the picture. Gravity is still around, water still has weight, but what's supporting it? Pretty much the straw. The inside, you know, it's a pipe here. It's, uh, visualize it here. There's a pipe, of pipe full of water, and the bottom of the pipe is holding the water up. What you do on the sides is up to you. I, mean, I can do this, I've got a straw here. Find some water that's not too disgusting. All right. So there's, there's water in a straw, and if I hold it level, the straw is supporting the water's weight, and the pressure on the right side of the straw and the pressure on the left side of the straw are both the same. They're both atmospheric pressure, and in fact, they're very, very uh, the same because they're at the same height above the ground. So it's the same air pressure completely, and the water just sits there. It's an object at rest, staying at rest. Inertia. If I add pressure to one side, I, and to do this I'm going to, you know, okay? If I boost the pressure on one side, now I've got a pressure imbalance. It accelerates. Off it goes. Um, anything else worth saying about this situation? I think that's good, good enough. Um, it, does lead, it does tempt me to, to talk about the motion of water in that straw. In this world of perfect, um, where we're, we're setting aside all the complexities of water, water, like everything else, has inertia, momentum, it's, it has velocity, all that stuff. And in the concept, the water at rest will stay at rest in the absence of forces, and water in motion will continue in motion in the absence of forces. It'll just coast. So in, in, in concept, you, if you had a long straw across the room and I got the water started on this side by, 
briefly having a pressure imbalance, it would coast the rest of the trip and come out the other side. In reality, that doesn't happen. You've never had that sort of situation occur where you get the water started in a hose and you disconnect it from the faucet and you just wait. The water's working its way along and then flies out the end. It doesn't happen. Why? Because water isn't perfect. It does rub on things. It has friction problems. So we'll come to those shortly. All right? So that was one question that came up, what horizontal straw. Second question is, if you remember, I showed you how a siphon works. And I took it, we had an aquarium tank full of water and a low tank. And if you manage to connect the, the high tank and a low tank with a tube full of water, the water would move from one to the other. I'm, I'm going to redo this so that I don't have to be perfect in say, telling you how that works. The question that came up was, can you get the water to go backwards? And the answer is yes. And here, so here's the story. Let me revisit the world of, of siphons in a, in a case where I've got a little more flexibility. The, the big aquarium I couldn't lift up and down, but these containers I can lift up and down. And here's water up high, having therefore a lot of gravitational potential energy. It has more gravitational potential energy here than it would have down here. So it, it to anthropomorphize it, it would love to get down there and get rid of some potential energy. Well, it can't do it right now because no connection. Um, but if I connect these two containers with a, with a hose that's completely full of water, and that's, that's my goal here is to get this, this guy completely full of water. I'm, I'm at least close. Come on. Oh, I'm going to do it with the. Oh, well. You can only get poisoned once. All right. So, ah. and instantly, I can keep the water in. You know the old trip of, trick of, of plugging one end of a. Of a of a uh, straw and keeping the water in as a result, you, you surely have done that, right? What you're doing is you're, you're, you're protecting a, a small region from the outside air and allowing its pressure to, to vary. And if the water tries to fall out of the straw, you know, the, I'm, I'm probably spoiling my, I'm gonna have to end up sucking the water in twice. Um, if the water tries to fall out of the straw, it creates low pressure above. And therefore, as a pressure imbalance, it tends to hold the water up in the straw. So it's not a big mystery. All right, I'll do this again. Tastes nasty. All right, so the water, the water is draining out. How is it doing this? It is, let me stop it for a second. And the way I can stop it is I put the two containers at the same height. But while the two containers were at different heights, the water discovered that it can get rid of gravitational potential energy by moving from one container to the other. And it does that, oddly, by going up and over. And before I discuss the up and over trick, let me remind you that, that water likes to get rid of gravitational potential energy by seeking its level. So when I, these, these vases, which are all connected at the bottom, it's not so remarkable that if I try to fill one of them up, the others fill as well. Right. Ah, poor better. What's happening, you, you can think of this in terms of, of potential energy, that as long as you had a, a column that was extra tall, it could certainly get rid of gravitational potential energy by moving the water up at the top into a, an empty spot down below in one of the other uh, little vases. So you can, you can think of it, it, this is the lowest potential energy it can, it can uh, adopt. Whenever, if you, have, if you have a high column, that's excess potential energy, it's gonna try to get rid of that. And you can also think of this in terms of pressure. That if you have a high column, one of the vases has too much water in it, the pressure at the bottom, because there's this gravitational gradient, the pressure at the bottom is big, bigger than any other pressure in the story, and it's gonna push water into the other, into the other vases. So you can think of it in terms of potential energy, or you can think of it in terms of pressure, and they're totally interrelated. It's the same story just looked at 
from a different angle. So the point of showing you this again is that these vases have e equalized the water level by flowing through the bottom. This is equalizing the water level in two, two containers by flowing up and over the top. It's the same story. It's just going up and over the top, which seems sort of mysterious. How does it manage to get up here? Why doesn't it just fall out? Well, if it tried to fall out, it would create an empty spot there that would have very low pressure. And there would be a pressure imbalance. And the water, the atmospheric pressure down here in the containers, at the surface of the water containers, would shove the water back up and to, to fill the top. So the top can't go empty. Yeah, Reed? Which, which, which side of the, of, of the like, siphon? You said like when you go to the siphon, low pressure, so the water flows towards that. Yep. I mean, like, what explains, like, why low pressure and then... Okay, so Reed's question is, is why is it low pressure in the middle? And, and, and then and ultimately, why does it flow one way or the other? It's, it's the water is, 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 there are more negotiations going on. I talked talk about negotiations the whole semester. When, the, if you fill, when I first filled this tube with water and just put it in there, momentarily, let's say it was basically the atmospheric pressure the whole, everywhere in the tube, give or take a tiny bit. And the water then started to fall out of the, uh, out of the uh, tube because it's got atmospheric pressure below, atmospheric pressure above. There's no pressure imbalance. So pressure, there's no forces due to pressure. The only thing around is the sheer weight of the water. So it begins to fall. And as it falls, it leaves an empty or effectively em empty spot behind it, which means the pressure at that point drops. And as the pressure drops, the, there's now a pressure-related force up on the columns. Both columns are pushed up. By, there's atmospheric pressure at the bottom, and less than above, it pushes up both, at both ends. And if I were really very careful, I could get that, that tube full of water. I could hold it here by the top and the two arms would be going down and they would be full of water and the water wouldn't do anything. It would be at equilibrium. It would be being pushed up at the bottom by atmospheric pressure and at the top middle that I'm holding, it would be below atmospheric pressure and there would be a pressure difference just enough to hold the column of water on the left, on the right for you, left, and it would sit there. If I made the slightest mistake and had one arm longer than the other though, then that arm would have it'd be ta a taller column now, supported by atmospheric pressure. It would have more trouble being supported. It's it weighs too much. It would begin to descend, and the other column would rise. Because the, other col other col the, the air pressure in the middle would be not enough, the low pressure, not enough to support the long column, and too much to support the, the short column. So the short column would be oversupported and it would go up, the long column would be under supported and go down, and the water would flow. And it, the whole thing would dump down the, the low end. And that's what we're doing here. Right now, the two columns, which have these funny extensions of them, they're equal. And it's sitting there perfectly happily. But as soon as I lift one of these up high, this portion is short. That column, it's over supported, and it's going to go up. And this column is under supported, and it goes down. And see, the, the water's draining out. Here it's coming. And I can reverse it. Is that OK? So, so this is, you know, for a siphon, there are a thousand ways you can think about it. I've tried several of them in the class here. They're all, it's getting, this guy's getting rid of gravitational potential energy. How? By working its way over the, over the top, vice versa. You can think of it in terms of the pressures and the imbalances in the water accelerating towards low pressure in each case. I mean, ultimately, 10 years from now, you may not remember all of why this works, but I hope you remember the concept, because it'll be useful to you. There will come a time when you want to drain something, and the two choices are to bail it one glass or one bucket at a time, or to use a siphon like this. If you've got a low spot in your yard, uh, or you're on a hill, and you've got some big container of water up at, the, at your house, you can drain it by, by letting the water go up and over and down the hill. That long arm, the water will go down the long arm and up the short arm and suck your tub dry.
All right? Oh, it ran out of water. Any other questions about siphons? Okay. Um, I think I've said, again, everything I wanted to say about sort of in the, about the ideal flow of water. I will remind you that, that in the ideal flow of water, if you go into this special situation of steady state flow, which means that, that you're, you're working where in an environment of plumbing or whatever where you can't see the passage of time, um, the, so the flow is just continues, it, 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 it's yeah, un unchanging, you can watch the, the fluid exchange energy between the different forms. Pressure potential energy being the, the, sort of the exotic new one, but otherwise gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. And, and just as, as a reminder, what, you know, the kinetic energy part of the, of the energy in water, when water is moving, like water sh shooting out of a, of a shower head or pouring out of the faucet fast, that motion gives the water kinetic energy. So the waters can convert its kinetic energy into gravitational and back and forth. And actually, let me, let me walk through the, the, six, the six ways you can trans... <laughs> How many fingers are I? The six ways the water can change its energy from one form to the other, because you might as well hear them once. And if you take water, in, in, again, it, and we're going to sort of assume steady state flow and, and perfection, no, 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 no rubbing. If you send water up a pipe, it doesn't change diameter. So it's a uniform pipe, and the water goes up. The water cannot speed up or slow down in going through this process. Why? Because if it slowed down on its way up the pipe, there would be a traffic jam. The water would be coming in fast and going out slow, and the pipe's got the same diameter in and out. What do you, you're, you're, you're accumulating gallons in the middle, and that, you can't do that. Water is incompressible. For all practical purposes, you can't pack it in there. So, so um, if you send water up a uniform pipe, it can't slow down. It also can't speed up, because if it did, it would leave gaps behind it. Um, my analogy for this sort of thing is like a, a uniform highway. You know, it's seven la lanes wide, and it's full of cars. And if, cars, if cars up front decide they're going to go from 60 miles an hour down to 40 miles an hour, it's going to just mess the whole flow up because otherwise the cars will start piling up. Um, so, uniform pipe, you can't slow down. As a result, the energy that's, that's disappearing, or sorry, to, as the water rises, it's gaining gravitational potential energy. It's going higher. So it has to get energy from some other form. It can't get that from the kinetic form because the water can't change speed. It's going at steady speed. The only thing you can get it from is pressure. So the pressure if you send water up a uniform pipe, it loses pressure, gains gravitational potential energy. Long, long harangue about a seemingly simple idea. Is that okay? If it goes down a uniform pipe, it can't speed up or slow down. Again, same problem, traffic jams, open, empty spaces. Therefore, it, it's losing gravitational potential energy. It's got to show up in some other form. Pressure potential energy. So water descending in a pipe loses gravitational potential energy, gains pressure potential energy. Um, where do these matter? Suppose you're, the plumbing of your house. As the water goes up to your attic, it's losing pressure in, in exchange for gravitational. The pressure up there is, is, is not as good in the attic as it was down in the basement. It's unavoidable energy issue. Um, on the other hand, if the water's coming down out of a water tower on the top of a hill, as it descends through this uniform pipe, it's losing gravitational potential energy, it must be gaining pressure potential energy. Sure enough, that's why they have water towers. At the bottom of the water tower, bottom, in the bottom of the hill, the pressure's huge. All the gravitational potential energy has been converted into pressure potential, potential energy, and you use that pressure to do stuff. All right? That's two of the transformations. Got four, le four left to go. How about if there's not a, a pipe? How about if the pipe is not uniform? For example, suppose instead of sending water up a uniform pipe, you send it up a fountain in the open air. In that case, as the water rises up, it, its speed can change. Nothing's preventing it from, there's no traffic jam, open space problem. So the speed of water coming up from a fountain 
uh, it, can, it can vary. What can't vary is the pressure of the water. Once the water's out there in the open air it, and exposed to atmosphere, to an atmospheric pressure, the pressure in the water is going to be atmospheric pressure. So if you wonder, what's the pressure of water in the, in the fountain you're watching? If that water's out there in the open air, it's atmospheric pressure. And so now you've got a situation where the pressure can't vary as the water rises. What happens to its energy? It's, uh, it's gaining gravitational potential energy as it goes up. Its pressure can't change because it's atmospheric. So it, where does the energy come from? It comes from kinetic energy. So the water loses kinetic energy as it rises in a fountain. It slows down and its height builds. So it's converting kinetic energy into, pressure, uh, into gravitational potential energy. Okay? And the reverse on the way down. As the water comes spilling down, say, off of a, uh, a, a pouring off a, a waterfall, or it can be the second half of the fountain. As the water comes down, it's turning gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. It's going faster and faster. That's two more of the transformations. The last two are the trickier ones, or ones that I haven't talked about yet for sure, but you've encountered them before, and I've shown you them by, without talking much about them. Nozzles and the opposite of nozzles. If you send water, not up or down, you know, just keep it at sort of the same level, so gravi gravitational potential energy doesn't change, and you send the water through a narrowing, you, it, it goes from, in a pipe that gets narrower. Well, if it's going in a pipe that gets narrower, it has to speed up. Well, for, first of all, I should say, because it's going horizontally, it's not allowed to change its gravitational potential energy. So any changes in energy are back and forth between the other two forms, pressure potential energy and kinetic energy. That's all you got to work with. All right, so send the, send the water into a narrowing in the pipe, which is a nozzle, okay? So it goes into that narrowing. It's got to speed up. And this is, I mean, I hope it's sort of common sense that if you try to pack that water that was moving along at this speed in a big wide pipe. You try to pack it into a really narrow pipe, it's going to have to go faster to, to get the job done. Uh, the analogy for this in terms of traffic is seven lane highway suddenly comes down to a, to a, to a one lane. Um, I mean, setting aside all the complexities of traffic which you've suffered over. Those seven lanes will be going very slowly, but once you get to, into that one lane, you go, you go fast because all the cars have to work their way through that one lane, bumper to bumper, they gotta go much faster than they did in the seven lanes. Is that intuitive enough? Same thing happens with water. If you neck the water down, it's gotta go faster. So you are forcing its kinetic energy to go up. Where does it get the energy from? Pressure potential energy. So nozzles um, reduce pressure potential energy in exchange for gaining kinetic energy. And this is, what, this is your common experience. You put a nozzle at the end of a hose or something like that. And as the water necks down into that nozzle, its pressure drops from water supply pressure, which is big, to atmospheric pressure. And once the water actually emerges from the, from the nozzle, its, it's pressure's plummeted. Where did the energy associated with the pressure go? It's now kinetic energy. And the bigger that pressure difference was, the bigger the kinetic energy will be. So ordinary household pressures that, that, that drop in pressure gives you water moving at, I don't know, 50 miles an hour or something like that. Go to, you get a bigger pressure drop between the pressure, say your pressure washer and atmospheric, that's a big pressure drop. Now the water in necking down can, can convert a lot of pressure potential energy into kinetic. It'll come out a couple hundred miles an hour. And there are systems where they, they take the water at, at tremendous pressure tens of thousands of, of pounds per square inch, and neck it down, and it comes out at essentially supersonic speeds, and it can drill holes and stuff. So they, they, they rock drills, there, there are drills and cutting tools that just use that nozzle effect to speed up water so fast that it cuts. All right? So that's a nozzle that if you, if you neck it down, you force the, the, uh, the fluid to convert pressure potential energy into kinetic. There's actually the reverse available, which is if you, if you anti-neck the water, you, you, you let it spread out, 
wider, it can slow down. And this, this is, a, again, the, the, the traffic analogy works. If you're coming out of a one-lane road onto a wide road, and everyone wants to be bumper to bumper, this is it's a weird traffic, because it's bumper to bumper traffic no matter where, where you are in my story. Um, it's incompressible fluid, has to be bumper to bumper traffic in cars. So as, as they spread out, everybody can slow down. Because they, they zoom through the narrowing, and then they slow down at the, the, the exit. When it gets wide, that property where, where you have a fluid that's flowing along and you, and you do the opposite of nozzling it, it's called a dif diffuser. Um, it's not unknown to many of you. If you put a gadget on the end of a hair dryer that necks out, it's, that's a diffuser. And it's, it's probably sold to you as a diffuser. And what the diffuser does is it allows the fluid air, in the, in the case of a hair dryer, to slow down and build pressure. It converts its kinetic energy into pressure potential energy. The pressure actually rises in going out of a diffuser. So the purpose of, of a hair dryer diffuser is, is to slow the air down so that it doesn't like blow your hair and you come out with a hair dude that's like one-sided heading off horizontally. Uh, it slows the air down, but, but the pressure actually does rise in that diffuser. The air slows down, the pressure rises. And you might think, well, but it's coming out at, air, at atmospheric pressure out of the diffuser. How can the pressure rise to atmospheric pressure? Well, it can. And the, the, the reason for that is the pressure before the diffuser in the hair dryer is actually below atmospheric pressure. If you drilled a hole in your hair dryer while the diffuser's on there and went and looked inside that pressure, it's actually it's, it's a partial vacuum, which may seem completely intuitive, unintuitive, like, wow, why you got, you got a partial vacuum inside? Yep, you do. And actually, diffusers, you, you, sometimes you don't need the physical diffuser to pull this off. If you just spray a jet of water against a, a wall, then the water, as it was flying along, and let's, let's, let's leave gla gravity out of the story for a moment. Just have the spray of water. I've turned off gravity. Click. The water is going, it's, it's coasting along uh, with its inertia. It then encounters the wall, and it spreads out like that. You, you've seen that happen, where the water hits and spreads. And that's the water slowing down as it, get, as it spreads wider, and its pressure is building. And the pressure in the place where the water hits the wall is higher than atmospheric pressure. And you know this because if somebody does that to your hand, it shoots a jet of water at your hand as the water's going along, it's atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure, <laughs> higher than atmospheric pressure. It pushes your hand back. So every time you shot stuff over with a, with a, with a spray of water, as the water is hitting and spreading, its pressure's rising. It's basically a diffuser without the physical diffuser there. Okay? Those are the six ways, the six sort of extreme cases of water converting its energy from one form to the other. And I think I've done them. Any questions about those? Uh, behind me, which is, uh, which is over-supported, which is under-supported. These two columns of water, when, I was doing the, when the siphon was working, it's, it's now defunct because I let air inside. This column, being very short, has a, has, a, has a small weight. And therefore, atmospheric pressure at the bottom and less than atmospheric pressure at the top, it's very easy for the pressure at the top to be, to be low enough to support this column. It's, a, does, it's not very tall, not very heavy. So you don't need a very good, uh, a very strong partial vacuum up there. It's very easy to have too much vacuum and therefore to over support the column. So the short column, it's very easy to be in a situation where the short column is pushed up too much relative to its tiny weight and therefore up it goes. So the short column tends to get, tends to go up towards the, towards the, the peak. The long column being long, being taller is heavier. And it's easy to be under-supported. The net force on it is downward. And it falls out of the, the arm and descends. So when the siphon was working, it was the short, it was the short arm that, was, that didn't weigh very much that went up and, because it's what, I, what I'm calling under-supported, over-supported. And the tall column being heavy descends. Is that OK? All right. So 
With that, then I, let me start bringing in the complexities of fluids. So uh, things like, like viscosity, which is related to you know, a, a friction-like effect. And now I've got this smoke generator making smoke, or at least last, it, last I knew it was. There we go. Okay, so now you can see these guys. <laughs> Something like they'll, they'll sit up at the ceiling and they'll sit there and swirl until they fall apart. They also stink. Sorry. <laughs> All right. You can try this after class. Now, now you can see what you're doing. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, back in the day, we, had a, we made a gadget that smoked five cigarettes in about two seconds. <laughs> but it was stinky, too. Right. Probably could do a, a vape version. All right. The, so the point, you know, fluid, fluids, are, fluids are real stuff. They do, they do interesting things, potentially do interesting things. The physics, of, the details of these vortex rings not important, but okay. So a um, couple of the complexities then to look at, the complexities associated with, with fluids. First one is viscosity. What viscosity is, is the measure. It's, it, it, is, it characterizes a fluid. A fluid is characterized by a viscosity. With exceptions, there are fluids that are too wacky to, for this. But the viscosity means that if you've got two layers of the fluid itself that are moving relative to one another, which is possible. You got to, you, you, yeah. You got, imagine if I blow the air over here to, to your right. The air down below didn't. I didn't push on it. Those two portions of air are now in relative motion. They're sliding across each other, and as they do, they exert forces on another. Forces that are called viscous forces, not surprisingly, and it's kind of like friction. It's friction within the fluid. So it's fluid la layer fluid A. <laughs> Sorry about this. A layer of fluid A, I'll turn it off. Okay, sliding across layer of fluid B. And that's like sliding friction. It has many of the features of sliding friction. That is, it wastes energy. So, so there, is, there is some energy that just vanishes from the story. Where does it go? It becomes thermal energy. Uh, the other thing about it that makes it a little different than sliding friction is sliding friction, when two surfaces are in relative motion across each other, it, it tends to be a, a, a specific force that each one exerts on the other. You know, they're a pair, of course. They're Newton's third law pair. My, my top hand pushes my bottom hand, and my bottom hand pushes back, equal and opposite forces. But that force is pretty much a, a specific value, no matter how fast my hands are sliding. That's not true for viscosity. The faster the layers of fluid are sliding across one another, the more they push. So viscosity is more aggressive than, uh, than, than sliding friction in causing trouble. And that has big consequences in your lives. So what's a, the what's a first observation that, that, will, that will show up about the, where, where viscosity shows up? Um, one of them is if you try to send water through a long pipe, like I've been doing for the past two days, well, it doesn't really go through as easily as I, as I initially claimed. You can't take a, a beautiful horizontal pipe that goes across the entire room, get the water moving in it, and expect it to coast all the way through. It won't do that. It will slow to a stop because of viscous forces. How's that? Well, the water right at the surface of the, of the pipe that, that's actually touching the pipe. And it's, a, it's a, it, it, an infinitesimal layer that's, that's on the surface. That water in, uh, is, is, is viewed by, by, by physics theory, basically, the physical, yeah, as, as not moving at all. It just sits there unmoving. Um, it, it, it's a, compl a complicated, messy story. But anyway, that water is, is stationary. The water next to it, though, is moving, and it rubs against it. So the, that, that outermost layer rubs against the next layer. And the, neck, the, 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 the third layer rubs against the second layer, and the fourth layer rubs against the third. And so pretty soon, the water going through this pipe 
is all aware of the surface of the pipe. It, it's, it's an indirect awareness. It knows that its neighbor isn't moving properly. And it, the, the neighbor's neighbor isn't moving properly all the way to the surface of the pipe. And the result then is that the water slows to a stop if you just try to get it going and let it rip. It will slow to a stop. So how do you get water to go through a pipe? It turns out you've got to push the whole way. And it's the same c concept as your common experience. If you want the bottle to move, you've got to push it the whole way. Well, that seems to fly in the face of inertia. No, the problem is that friction's in there fighting you. And as a result, you can't see the beauty of inertia and that forces cause accelerations because of friction. So all you see is that you have to keep pushing the whole way. And water in a pipe, you got to keep pushing the whole way because of the same stuff. So how do you push? You push with a pressure, pressure difference. You put high pressure on the entry side, low pressure on the, on the exit side, and that pressure difference pushes the whole way. So how hard do you have to push? And basically, how, much, how fast does the water go when you push like this? And it's a complicated, that question is a complicated one. But it turns out that the longer the pipe is, the, the more you have to push. And basically, um, if you don't push, if you don't change how hard you push, basically you start with a certain pressure at the front and end with maybe atmospheric pressure at the end, as the pipe gets longer, you're using that same pressure difference against more rubbing problem. So the, so the flow decreases. So it turns out the flow through a pipe is pretty much inversely to, proportional to its length. Double the length the, you, you have the flow of fluid th through it. It's not, not too unexpected. Um, so long pipes, hard to get the water through it. Second thing is the higher the viscosity of the fluid, the more syrupy it is, the more it rubs against itself, the harder it is to get to get the flow to go through. So not surprisingly, you know, what is viscosity? How do you measure it? Eh, we'll leave that aside. But, but uh, if you double the viscosity of, of a fluid by changing it from water to something that's thicker than water, you have the flow through, through the pipe. That's also not too surprising. Um, the third thing that's not surprising is if you double the pressure difference across the pipe, which is to say you push twice as hard, you double the flow through it. Also not surprising. Where's, what's surprising? There's, there's one thing that's surprising, and that is, what if you change the diameter of the pipe? And you might think that you double the diameter of the pipe, you double the flow. No, it's not that. You double the diameter of the pipe, and a, and a whole bunch of things happen. First off, if you double the diameter of a, of a, of a cylinder, you're doubling it in, in two directions, up and down and left and right. So you actually are, you've got four times the area to go through if you double the diameter of a cylinder. You know, this is much bigger than this, okay? The other thing is you're getting, as you double the diameter, you're getting the fluid away from the walls. And the walls are where, are where, the, where the trouble really is occurring because the, the water isn't moving at the walls. So doubling the diameter gets you away from the top wall, gets you away from the side walls. It's really good. And it, it turns out you get another factor of four from getting the fluid away from the walls. Uh, most of the flow in a, in a pipe, in this, in this situation where viscosity is, is dominating the flow, most of the flow is at the center of the pipe, where it's far from the walls and can move fast. So when the dust settles, it turns out the flow in a pipe is proportional to the fourth power of the diameter, or the radius, pick, take your pick. So if you take a, a hose that's one inch in diameter, you can get a gallon through in, 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 in a, minute. If you take a hose that's two di inches in diameter, instead of getting one gallon, instead of getting two gallons, instead of getting four, you can get 16 gallons through it in a minute. It goes up, doubling the diameter gives you 16 times as much flow. And I can show you that here with this. So here's a tank of water, and there's a pressure here that's produced by the, by the column of water from this height down to there. So there's, a, there's, you know, there's that much height's worth of gravitational potential energy that will become pressure potential energy coming out of that outlet. And we'll use that pressure difference, that, that higher pressure here, and atmospheric pressure to push a column of water through various capillaries. So these, these 
These two are, this, this one's a factor of two in diameter compared to that. So here's, here's, let me start, this is a leaky, messy thing, but I'll do it anyway. Here's the little pipe, and, you know, drip, drip, it's a little too, oh, I have to let atmosphere in. You know, drip, 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 all right? If I double the diameter, and, and basically nothing else, let me, I'll, I'll put that on to slow the flow. Ah, there we go. Much more water through. All right. So, you know, what should you take away from this? You won't remember the factor of 16 by doubling, but what you, what you can remember is, is it's really important what the diameter of the hose is. So, uh, and, and the effect is, is dramatic. So, for example, in a house, some of you live in houses that have essentially old plumbing, and the water doesn't flow very fast or hard out of the showers or out of the faucets. What's going on? Is, is the, is the, are the pipes like totally shrunk by, by virtue of having minerals in them? No, it doesn't take very much mineral accumulation on the inside of the pipe to narrow it, say, by a factor of two, in which case the water that flows through it is down by a factor of 16. It's a disaster. Same thing with your arteries and veins. If you narrow them a little bit by virtue of eating, I don't know, eating the wrong stuff and bad luck and other things, it can have a dramatic effect on the fluid flow, on the, on the blood flow through your, through your body. So, so narrowing is a big deal. Um, another, one other practical case that, that comes to mind, when you go to the hardware store to buy ho a hose for your garden, there are two classic diameters in the United States. One of them is five-eighths of an inch in diameter, and one of them is three-quarters of an inch in diameter, which five-eighths is just barely smaller than three-quarters. So like, who cares? Ah, the difference in flow between those, after you raise them to the fourth power, is a factor of two. So the bigger hose carries a lot more water than the little hose. And this is why the you know, firefighters, they obviously, they're, they're working with hoses not this big in diameter, but this big in diameter. So they can carry hundreds, thousands of times as much water as your, as your garden hose. OK? All right. Um, that's the role of viscosity. Um, that, that'll do. OK, so uh, next thing to look at, the uh, uh, sort of complexity of water, is uh, the fact that water does not always smo flow smoothly. Up until now, I've talked about water flowing as though it's this wonderfully orderly thing that goes into a pipe, through a nozzle, out a nozzle up into the air. Well, water can break up into individual portions that travel so, essentially independently. And there is a constant tension between viscosity, the syrupiness of water, which tends to keep the water all flowing together. So every portion of water in, a, in a, the flow of fluid, uh, it tries to keep it ordered and together. And everybody goes through the same paths and so on. That's, that's what viscosity's role. The other thing's role is inertia. Inertia tends to, to be, uh, it's the libertarian of, of, of fluids. It's, you know, me for myself. And so, which is probably a wrong characterization, and I apologize. So if you get the water going, this portion of water going that way, and that por portion go, uh, going that way, they don't care. They go independently in their way based on inertia. So, so you've got the great organizer, which, which is viscosity, the, the enemy of organization, which is inertia, they, they have a battle always. And if viscosity wins, that, it, that is, the organizer wins, the flow is smooth and what's known as laminar. So in laminar flow, you can put drops of ink in the flow, separated by a small distance from one another, and watch them go through the flow, and they come out, and they, the drops may have moved apart somewhat or come together or gotten long and thin, and various, but, but, there, but if you know where one drop is, you know where the other drops are. They're all sort of orderly. That's laminar flow. The other possibility, turbulent flow, you can't do that. If you've got turbulence in there, which is caused, which is driven by an inertia, then the drops get torn apart and knowing where one drop is doesn't tell you anything about where the other ones are. They're just like, they're all free, it's a big free-for-all. 
And it really is a situation where if, if, if a flow is dominated by viscosity, you get this lovely laminar behavior. If the do flow is do dominated by inertia, you get this ripped apart, everybody, everybody for themselves. And I can try to show you, I'll do my best on this one. See, so audience camera up there. You are looking down right now at this tray. Let me get this out of the. Uh, I go swimming with my tie. Here. You're looking at this tray. Hi up there. Okay. And this is a fluid that's supposed to help you see the local motion. It's its own local motion. Eh, I'm not convinced you'll be able to see much. This is always a little bit underwhelming, but I'll give it a try anyway. If I move the fluid past an obstacle, or if I move the obstacle past the fluid, it does, it's the same story. It doesn't matter who's moving. So I'm, I'm not going to move the fluid. I'm going to move the obstacle through the fluid. And the obstacle is just a, a, a pop, you know, tongue depressor. Say, ah, ah. Okay. If I go slowly, that makes inertia less important. And I should get laminar flow. And you'll see, do you see some swirls in there? I don't know whether this is worth. Let me, let me dim the lights. You, you all can slip out then unnoticed. Um, <laughs> so at low speed, at low speed, viscosity dominates the flow. And you get kind of a nice, eh, smooth pattern. I don't know whether it's. I can, I, can, I can be more dramatic here. If, it, if I go fast, inertia becomes very important. And I'll start getting. I'll, I'll start getting um, Turbulence. Yeah, it's, 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 it's impossible. But you all can do this and have done this your whole lives. Let me tell you how you've done it. When you go and you, and you want to mix the milk or sugar or whatever in your coffee, you go in there with a stick, a spoon, or something like that. If you go very slowly through the, through the coffee, you are allowing viscosity to have enough time to keep the flow orderly and you don't leave swirls, very many swirls behind you, swirls being the hallmark of vortices, being the hallmark of turbulence. You don't leave very many, and you don't mix very well. It does, it's not very effective to go really slow with your. It turns out that the transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow in most water based drinks with objects the size of your fingers is kind of 10, 10 centimeters per second. If you go slower than that, you get laminar flow. If you go faster than that, you get turbulent flow. So when you, when you stir coffee, you know, you, you know from habit, you go fast. You drive it into the turbulent regime where inertia wins. It swirls everything up. The, the pieces of sugar or milk, whatever, get torn apart, spread all over, and you get a uniform mix. So um, that's, that'll do it for, vis for viscosity, turbulence, and laminar flow and inertia. And we'll pick it up on Wednesday.